Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Max Fab Consulting. Yes, we are here with the founder and the owner, Dave Nordell. Excited to have him live on the podcast and on the Zoom cast to talk more about the work he's doing uh, with really uh, exceptional leadership programs, uh, consultations, and really dedicated to empowering others and people and inspire them to really live, well, their best life, become a leader, and so on and so forth. Let me introduce the man of the hour, Dave Nordell. How are you? Hey, thanks, Jill, and uh, good morning. Uh, well, it's good morning. Close to, it's close to your afternoon. It's still the middle of my morning, so that's, that's good. right. Well, you're out of uh, Illinois. You're uh, no. Montana. Yeah, Montana. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show again. I uh, good to it. have you here. Please introduce yourself to everyone to start. Sure, I'm Dave Nordell. Um, you know, I could I could start back from where I was born and where I'm from. I grew up in Northern California on a dairy farm in the in the in the middle of nowhere, and and uh, after you know. 19 years of, uh, of that experience, which kind of shaped me uh, through my leadership journey, which is things that I write about. Um, I did 30 years, six months and 24 days in the United States Air Force, um, traveled the world and had a great opportunity to not only be developed as a leader, but uh, an awesome opportunity to lead people in all kinds of environment to include combat. So that drives the mission of Max Fab. And, you know, Mac, Ma, Max Fab, people sometimes say, what's Max Fab? And maximum fabulous is an attitude. And it's probably the highest attitude that you can carry on a daily basis. And uh, in some pretty austere situations when, uh, when things were fairly difficult, especially when I was leading, I used to kind of insist with the team that, uh, you know, we're always working towards Max Fab. So that's why the company's named that, you know, attitude is everything. And if you have the right attitude, you can could probably accomplish anything. So, and you mentioned, you mentioned my little journey with leadership and, and we can talk more about it, but, you know, the company and, and then, in, you know, the Associated Institute, the Apex Leadership Institute that I'm involved in really focuses on, on a gap that uh, exists in our nation. And I'll give you some data and then we can chat, but you know, the average person starts starts leading other people, which is probably one of the biggest responsibilities we have in our life, short of parenting. And you start leading other people at the age of 30. By the age of by the age of 39, you're leading people that are leading people. So manager, director, right? That's the easy way to put that. By the age of 42, somebody says we should probably invest some leadership training in it. So you have this 12 year void of just kind of swimming around and hopefully you got the right mentor. Hopefully you got the right boss. Hopefully uh, you pick things up quickly. Maybe you have some natural traits. I will tell you from the first day that I walked into basic training in 1984 until the day I left in 2014, I never stopped getting developed as a leader. And the importance of that is how that resonates through our country, how that resonates for the you know future generations, how that resonates for workplace and, and what keeps people at work and happy. We spend a third of our lives at work. Why shouldn't we have good leaders? So there's the mission. Got it. Well, we're excited to have you. How can we find you? Hmm. It's easy. Everything. I just published a new book. It's called uh, uh, When the Cows Lie Down. Uh, that's a farm reference to when all the cows are lying down, usually huddled together, it usually means there's going to be a significant event, probably something negative, like a weather event. You should probably pay attention to that. But the subtitle is why people quit you, their leader. And there's good quitting, bad quitting and quitting when you don't have a choice. And the book kind of runs, kind of runs through those things. So uh, yeah, you can find me at maxfabconsulting.com. So M-A-X-F-A-B consulting.com. On there, you can get my uh, my newsletters, my blogs. Uh, I have my own podcast, which I've had some wonderful leaders on. Kind of, it's the Kangaroo Leadership Podcast, and you kind of have to qualify to be on the podcast. You have to be a kangaroo and leader, which book and author. All and of it. It's all there. Yeah, it's you, all got, there. you have it's a lot there. to talk yeah. about. All yeah, right, sure. what Thanks. did you want to kind of get into for today? Well, I mean, today's mission, you know, my 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 subset of all that leadership stuff is I'm very passionate about my veteran community. You know, veterans are um, are institutionalized just like prisoners. Uh, when you go in the United States military, you learn a different language and a different culture, and there's some wonderful things that happen to you to include leadership. Uh, you quickly develop critical thinking skills. You're given responsibilities that are probably not commensurate with your age or your education. 
uh, you're put in a situation where you're able to succeed through all of that. Uh, you have huge camaraderie, you have huge brotherhood, and you have uh, a sense of safety. You know, you've got a guy to your right and left or a gal to your right and left that that are, are taking care of it. There's a huge team aspect of that. When you get out, um, that all goes away. And there's there's catch points out there, the Veterans Administration, or, you know, there's there's some people out there that will, quote unquote, help find you a job. But you need to be able to come back to a place that you can reassimilate to. So I'll give you an example. If you showed up for a job interview and you were in a wheelchair and you were deaf in your right ear and the employer wanted to hire you, he would already know, even, even through his HR policies, but he would he or she would already know whether or not where, the, where you're going to sit, what your cubicle looked like, what the bathrooms need to look like, where the rails needed to be, what the ramps needed to be to look like, and who was going to get you out of the place of during a fire. Veterans, we come with this need for purpose, this need for camaraderie, this need for team. And quite frankly, that's not there. And it's nobody's fault other than the fact that we haven't trained these wonderful people out there that run businesses on how to bring veterans into their environment. So I've started a program called Vet Ready. Uh, we're doing it in conjunction with our local chamber of commerce, which I invite any chamber of commerce to give me a call and ask how we've done it. Uh, to give gold ribbons, gold ribbon programs to identify employers as veteran ready after they've gone through um, some of my teaching, some of my programmatics, and then some workshops so that they can understand uh, uh, what veterans need. Because it's not just important for veterans to have a job or to have a home, but let me give you some Montana statistics. Montana per capita is number one or number two in veteran population. So 12% of all of Montana is, uh, is veterans. Mom. Uh, we're number one or number two in veteran suicide. We're number one or number two in veteran substance abuse. And we're number one or number two in veter veteran mental health need. And we're number 44, 44 in services. If you look at your life team, no matter where you're at in life, you have a life team. And a lot of it stems from your social environment at work. Well, 43 out of every 100 veterans that get out today. And by the way, our nation our nation's Department of Defense and the Department of Transportation with the Coast Guard puts 1,300 brand new veterans into the population every day. Where, if you include their families, it's about the, the size of a small town of three to 5,000. So if you think about that, why would you not have an environment to bring these veterans in to help transition? Because we we come with challenges. It's hard. It's, it's no different than picking up and moving from Florida to, to Nome, Alaska. That's going to be challenging. And you would hope somebody in Nome, Alaska had a little bit of sensitivity to the fact that, you know, you like sunshine and the beach and those type of things. And not that they can give that all that to you, but but to create the environment that helps us reassemble. Because when you do that and that one third of your life that I talked about, our veteran issues start to start to get better. And so we're still losing 44 veterans a day to self-elimination. Uh, it's pretty much a, it's an unacceptable number. It's, you know, it's a pandemic of its own. And uh, we haven't really been able, been able to whittle away at that. So the mission is is to is to work through public private partnerships and put the civilian employers in a position where from day one they can make an environment for the veterans to be mentally, physically, and emotionally healthy. Well, thank you. Wow, Dave, I'm honored to be able to speak with you here and knowing that you're doing so much to help so many people, my goodness. And, um, you know, since this is our first time talking, um, could you just share just a little bit more of your background? And, you know, uh, sure. you mentioned your uncle, right? Served in, it was World War II, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was my, my grandmother's brother. Okay served in world war ii he was a combat engineer in the army so if you understand that job that's your your forward of the most forward people right you're mm -hmm. building bridges and, and doing all the reconnaissance that goes along with that and he fought all through north africa and through italy up to the boot uh right from the beginning of the war so he was gone for you know or just a little over four years during the entirety of world war ii it made it a big impression on me and i wanted to go in the military when i was younger because of him I wanted to go in the Navy and be a plumber. And, uh, you know, I had another cousin that was a plumber. He's making a good living. And I figured, you know, four years in the Navy, be a plumber, come back. I can work for him. I'll make a great living, raise a great family, and all will be well. And on the day when all the recruiters were in the room, the Navy recruiter was about as rude as you could be. And the Air Force recruiter put his arm around me and said, 
I think we can do something for you. And I said, I want to be a plumber. And he said, we'll see. And the Air Force decided that I needed to go into medicine. And it was the exact right, right job. So I ended up being a medic. Uh, and through that time frame, I, I became an advanced medic and worked on my own out in austere environments as kind of a dock in the box, do everything that a hospital does kind of thing. Uh, I put myself through nursing school, did shock trauma, and I'm an ER nurse. And my graduate degree is in emergency and disaster management. So I'm the guy that tells you which way to drive out of town during hurricanes and how to plan and prepare for all that on top of those things. So 30 years took me through a lot of leadership positions to include combat. And my last combat tour was in Iraq in 2008. And uh, that was leading a lot of people. And that's where Max Fab came from. You know, if you're watching on the video and you see the flag behind me, that flag was the flag that flew over the trauma center for the main trauma uh, facility for all of Iraq. And when I left, the folks that worked for me pulled that down and put some dates and, and reference points on that honored the tour. But on the bottom of the flag, it says Maximum Fabulous. And so there, there's the origin of Max Fab Consulting and, and why it's there. So yeah, so I'm a nurse and an emergency manager and now an author. And, and you know, you get to a point in time where you get given all these gifts in life. I feel like sometimes I've lived the life of, lives of three to five men. Uh, you get all these gifts and I guess, you know, at a certain point in time, you can either pass them out like Santa or just hang on to them until you go. And so here we are, giving back, which is the title of the first book. Aww. Awesome. Wow. Okay. What else did you have for us today? There's still so much to you and your work. So I want to make sure we're covering everything, Dave. Sure. Well, so kind of the kind of the next step, and I'm going to speak at this. There's a the Veterans Hall of Fame is doing their induction. In fact, they're in, inducting Colin Powell uh, and some other really significant military leaders over the years, uh, some posthumously and, and some are still alive. And I'm going to speak, it's, it's going to be a 10 minute speech and this will be in Atlanta in November, on November 4th. But what I'm going to cover is a thing called moral injury. And, you know, for your, for your listeners, they understand PTSD, you know, our veterans are, are we have a high, high um, uh, population of veterans that have PTSD for whatever reason, whatever their exposures are. And, and I'm one of those, especially from my, from my medical time. But I'm also the owner, the proud owner, of moral injury. And this is kind of a, an anomaly for people that aren't close to it or or um, uh, fully understand it. So along with this mission and this education piece is really talking about moral injury and making sure that we take care of that for our veteran population. Uh, statistically, it looks like about 40% of military personnel come out of the military with moral injury. And so I'll explain that to you, and then you'll then you'll know what my ten minute talk is going to be about. <laughs> okay. When we when we grow up, you know, our inner child, when it's developed by our parents and the other people that influence us, and the things that happen to us, right? The the the, the really good things and the educational opportunities and the trauma things, right? The things that that really shape us. You know, I write my book about being run over by a tractor when I'm when I was four. That's a pretty vivid memory to me. I can still smell and feel that whole situation. So foundationally, you leave with, with your morals and your ethics, right? And that comes from your religion and your family and your heritage and how all the things that you're raised with, the things that you believe uh, to be true. And these are the things that make humans great, right? Because I'm a firm believer that all humans want to do good. Uh, sometimes we emphasize, you know, the lower percentages of humans doing bad, but every day humans are doing good. When you go in the military, you meet two phenomena. One is called doctrine. And military doctrine is the way you do things when you fight war. It's just a checklist. If this happens, you do these things. The second thing is direct orders, orders that you have to carry out. So I'll tell you a story real quick. So here's the example. When And this is really condensed in this story. So if I lose the impact, I apologize. But we were going to do a major operation in Iraq. It was scheduled. It was going to look something like Fallujah. Everybody kind of knows that word. There's enough movies been made about it. It's going to look kind of like Fallujah. Military medical doctrine requires you to clear the beds. And mm -hmm. the, there's there's a title in the book called Clearing the Beds. And uh, the uh, Center for Air and Space Power is going to publish this in their journal here shortly, um, this chapter. When you clear the beds, you have to empty out the hospital completely because you need to have everything ready in a pristine state for all the casualties that are generated from this operation. 
But for us to do that during my time in Iraq, we had to move Iraqi civilians that had been caught up in, in war. These were children and men, and they had been with us for a long time, getting very intensive care. Uh, we knew their families. Uh, you know, they, there was just an extensive you know relationship with their families and them because we had put a lot of time and effort and resources into them, and, we, and this required us to move them. The dilemma was, is if we moved them, we couldn't move them to a facility that could take care of them. And at that point in time, the Iraqi medical system could only do one thing, and that was to remove all of the th things that we were using to keep them alive. And if the patient lived, they lived, and if they died, they died. And we knew that we were going to have to euthanize 12 people to make this happen. And so, Jill, can you imagine a hospital full of doctors and nurses and people trying to make this decision? Right. First of all, first and foremost, the dilemma that goes along with that, because you yeah. have people, you have people that are going to follow orders and you have other people that say, I'm, I don't know if I'm all on board. Well, long story short is we moved all 12. So we euthanized 12 people and then we never did the operation. Yeah. It never happened. So you get to take that with you for the rest of your life. You own that. That's your moral injury. And that's, and that's the, the sacrifice that military people make. I mean, these are the things that, you know, when you raise your hand, people people go, yeah, you raise your hand and you said you'll die for your country. Well, there's things short of dying for your country that are fairly severe too. And these are, these are kind of some of the things that are out there. So we need to do more education on that. We need to make sure that we have avenues for people to address that. And you even have military people that, that say, gosh, you know, nobody blew me up. I don't have PTSD, but something's not right with me. Yeah. So. By saying it out loud, uh, it get, once it gets a name, then we can we can get people in the right place to do helping and 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 those type of situations. So yeah. Wow, Dave. At uh, this time, would you mind just reminding our listeners how we can contact you, please? Sure. It's uh, maxfabconsulting.com. That's M-A-X-F-A-B consulting.com. Uh, go to the go to the contact us page, and you can write me a note. I, I'll do a free 30-minute consultation with you. We're going to have this similar conversation. If you're just an individual that wants to reach out or if you're a company that's curious about uh, uh, what's next, especially with the Vet Ready program and, and how we have these conversations to show you how veterans can make your organization stronger, and we can, uh, and we can uh, definitely show you how to help veterans do this transition piece with a couple of the things that I just explained. Uh, amazing that uh, you're doing so much to help it's it's really it's fascinating and again it's maxfabconsulting.com could you share um a little you know i mean i also know you do motivational speaking mm -hmm. team building um and could you just share some uh, another story about you know someone that you've helped and some of these veterans that you have put into place and how you've changed their lives and what career paths have they gone into because they're so important to our society and it's so sad that sometimes they get forgotten, right? It's it's such a shame. They're so talented and they're uh, what they've done for us um, in the whole country. So what types of careers are you see mostly, you know, guiding people in? Is there like a, a certain business that really, is it automotive? Is it, you know, what types of, you know, what do you see being one of the most sure. common career paths that they can go into? So one of the things that people in my situation, you can kind of find collectively, I always, I always regret that I gave really bad advice to young people when they were getting out when I was in, because I didn't know what it was like to be out. And one of the things that we tell veterans is to slow down, take the time off that you deserve and to really go out and find what you want to do. Most veterans, Jill, will lean into what their technical competence was, right? So I'm a nurse. So it's easy, right? Just get out and be a nurse. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a, I'm a plumber. It's easy to just get out and be a plumber. Well, what if you're a, a member of a tank crew? And you're an Army, you know, you're an Army E4, you know, a young guy, and you're a member yeah. of a tank crew. You come with all of these tr tremendous skills, but it's hard to get on a piece of paper and it's really hard to articulate. And it's hard for civilian employers to absorb what you're capable of. So they started entry-level jobs, which are very unsatisfying. And they need to take their time to do those to do those kind of things. I'll, I'll tell you impactful stories. You know, finding veterans sometimes in our society is difficult. Now we have license plates, and you know, you'll see the guys that wear the hats, uh, which which I appreciate. I usually stop and engage engage with those folks, and you know, it's it's more about it's more about educating to the point of what comes after. Thank you for your service. If, you, if you're truly thankful for something, 
you want to do something in return. You know, vet ready is one of those things. You want to do something in return. Here's what I'll tell your audience if they want to make an impact. And here's where I've made an impact. Because when I meet fellow veterans, and I don't know anything about them, but there's automatically an immediate bond. I never say thank you or, or you know, sometimes I give them a hug. You know, they're my brothers and sisters. But all I have to do is say, tell me your story. And you know, one of the, the one of the biggest healing powers that we possess as human beings is listening. And if you say out loud, tell me your story and you listen, veterans that are struggling heal. And sometimes they'll even ask you for help. And then you can intervene. So, for instance, I just ran into a veteran uh, the other day. Didn't know he's a veteran. We were at a meeting. He just said, I'm a retired Air Force guy. Automatically, that's a bond. We're going to go talk. And in 30 minutes, Joe, we're outside, tears running down his face. The guy's, the guy's bigger than me. I'm not a small guy. And the guy's bigger than me. Uh, he's the fireman and, and uh, has done some wonderful things in his, in his post-military life. And he's got tears running down his eyes. And he tells me, you know, I, I have I've lost my purpose. I don't know where I'm at in the world. I'm really struggling. And, you know, we're hugging, we're hugging like uh, we're long lost brothers. And that relationship has continued. And now I'm there and he's there for me. And and so we just pick up the slack and and fill the gaps. That's that's very informal. But uh, but as you know, uh, it's one it's one at a time. I mean, you can't do all of this at once. So we need to it needs to have a little more formal environment. And where, and where do most people get up and go every day? To work. And so we need to create environments at work where where that's safe and they can grow. Well, also, uh, let me ask you, as you're authoring now, how many books do you have? <laughs> well, there's a lot of fun stuff going there. So yeah. I have, I have the first edition is called Giving Back Life and Leadership from the, car, from the Farm to the Combat Zone. There's a second edition of that that I co-authored with my friend Darla, Darla Tyler McSherry, which adds in a component of mental health and and some awareness around the things that we can do to actually be, uh, even at the novice level, to actually be an adjunct to make sure that, that people don't commit suicide, don't self-eliminate. So those, those two versions. So the next book is When the Cows Lie Down, which I've explained in detail. There's a third book coming that I'm co-authoring with 11 other veterans. It's called Leave No Veteran Behind. And that book's nationally. So there's veterans all over the nation the, through the 12 of us. And we've all written chapters in there about our veteran experience. Some positive, some negative, some are women, you know, and some are women veterans from a long time ago. So the struggles of being, being a woman in the military, you know, in the 60s or 70s, which is a whole different dynamic uh, and those type of things. So that's a magnificent book. And, and we're super excited about that. And then I have a friend here in town that's a tremendous leader. Our leadership genres are completely, I shouldn't say completely different. We have the same passion, same kind of focus, especially on young leaders. But uh, we're doing a we're doing a, a coloring book, an adult leadership coloring book. And it's based around the leadership traits of animals and how you develop those. So you get to color on the left side, which is your meditation point. You get to learn on the right side, which is your Q&A. So that's all that's out there. So stand by for the coloring book. We're excited about that. And leave no veterans behind. You'll see on my website. So if you go on there, you'll see where you can do a, you can you can do a pre buy on that. That's going to be a lot of fun with that right. book. And we'll we'll be out speaking on that. So well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, we are just about out of time, yeah. unfortunately, Dave. So we got to remind you. everyone how we could reach you, please. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Maxfabconsulting.com. M A X F A B Consulting. Dot com. That's Dave Nordell. Reach out. I'm uh, more than willing to have a chat. It won't even cost you any money. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave, right. again, uh, MaxFab uh, Consulting. And uh, remind us of uh, how we can find your books. Sure. That stuff is on Amazon. But if you go to the website, you can just, just two clicks and you can be on the book. But uh, all the books are on Amazon. And please go to the website and look for the pre-sales on leaving a veteran behind. Cause I think that's just going to be an awful powerful book to read for anybody. It doesn't matter if you have a military background or not. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. All right. Pleasure you having it. you here. And thank yeah. you for the conversation today. And thank you for doing what you do. And uh, hopefully we will connect soon. Peace out. Enjoy Peace out. a great Thanks, uh, holiday Joe. Labor Day weekend. Okay. You Bye. Bet.
Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.